I will share your session and say a few words when, uh, well, actually it's about time to start. So are you, are you ready? I'm all set. Okay, very good. So, um, uh, Sébastien, shall we start? Shall I say yes. a few words of introduction? Yes? Yes, so, yeah, Francois, please go ahead and uh, introduce our speaker. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, thank you. So, uh, I'm uh, very um, uh, glad to introduce uh, Pierre Kumar, who is uh, a professor at uh, Texas A&M. Uh, after many years at uh, UIUC. Um, so, uh, 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 Pierre Kumar, lots of uh, uh, um, interest close to, to ours. He's, he has uh, uh, very beautiful contributions to, to many fields. Uh, uh, I would quote in particular his, uh, his famous work on scaling laws, uh, which was uh, very influential for many of us. Uh, his work uh, on on uh, on control and uh, his work on the stability of queues, the famous Luan Kumar uh, paper, uh, which uh, 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 established this surprising result that queues with a load factor uh, less than one could be unstable. Uh, he's, uh, he's also very active uh, in the field of uh, real-time uh, control uh, queues and systems with, with deadlines. Lately, was interested uh, in cyber security and in a variety of uh, questions pertaining to machine learning. Uh, he's, at, uh, the, he's the founder of a, a very active school in the US and, and outside the US. Uh, so I'm very, very glad to uh, uh, have uh, uh, him uh, giving this uh, lecture today. Pierre. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Francois. Uh, can I share my screen? Please. Okay. Can you see it? Very good. Okay. And I'm going to go full screen. Just let me know if it's visible. Is it okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francois, for those uh, overly generous uh, remarks. I appreciate it. And uh, it's good to at least get out uh, virtually nowadays. So today I'm going to talk of uh, security of uh, cyber physical systems. And uh, a lot of the theory is from the uh, PhD thesis of uh, my ex-student uh, Bharadwaj uh, Sachidanandan, who's currently a postdoc at MIT. And then there I'm going to report on several uh, implementations uh, which have been done with a whole bunch of uh, students uh, and uh, other faculty. Okay, first of all, I don't think it needs introduction, but what are cyber physical systems? These are engineered systems in which computing, communication, and control are tightly integrated. And uh, many societally important future infrastructures uh, use, will use this, are using this, a smart grid, automated transportation system, unmanned aerial vehicle transportation systems, water treatment facilities, telesurgery systems, et cetera. And these systems are all safety critical. <clears throat> what that means is that if they malfunction, it can actually cause physical harm. And they're also critical infrastructure as far as the economy uh, and the societal well being is concerned. At the same time, as you start networking uh, the cyber physical system, they become vulnerable to attacks. And in fact, this networking gives hackers the ability to cause damage in the physical world. Uh, until now, hackers could only tamper with the information bits in the cyber layer, so they can corrupt my email message or my website or get some information. But this uh, cyber physical systems couple the cyber and the physical world, so by hacking, they can actually cause a lot of damage. And in fact, there have been many, many attacks, uh, sewage treatment plants, nuclear power plants, uh, uranium uh, enrichment centrifuge in Iran that everybody probably knows about the Stuxnet worm, uh, lots of SCADA uh, systems, Ukraine power grid, water filtering plants, etc. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we want to protect all these. And the question is, if you have not been able to do this for networking or operating systems and so on, how on earth can we protect even more complicated cyber physical systems? And what I want to show you is that by taking a different viewpoint, we can actually think of protecting them. So the abstraction of the system is very, very important. So this overall system has at its core, a physical plant. The physical plant could be an automobile. 
It could be a power system. It could be a chemical process control, a refinery, oil refinery, whatever. And there are many actuators into the physical plant. For example, if it's a car, you have your gas pedal, your steering wheel are actuators. If it is an oil refinery, it could be a level control system for a fluid or a temperature set point or whatever. And uh, there are sensors. Sensors will measure temperatures, pressures, velocities, etc. And the loop between sensing and actuation is closed uh, over a information network that can consist of many routers, dumb routers, just forwarding, or it could consist of computational nodes which do some information processing. The issue is that we want to address is some of these routers, computation node sensors, actuators may be compromised, okay? And then the question is how can we secure the overall cyber physical system when some nodes are compromised? So most important is having the right abstraction. So what we're going to say is if information from a sensor is compromised, we will say that the sensor itself is compromised. Okay, it doesn't matter to me where the information got compromised. As long as it's, the information I'm getting is wrong, I'll regard the sensor as compromised. And it doesn't matter whether it's compromised at the sensor itself or downstream. <clears throat> so the abstraction that we are going to work with is very simply, either sensors or actuators are compromised. That's all. And in fact, uh, how do we secure this overall cyber physical system when some sensors and actuators are compromised? And today I'm going to focus on the case of compromised sensors. Okay, I'm not going to talk uh, much about, uh, actually not anything at all today about actuators. The central idea that we're going to use is something called dynamic watermarking. And it's a very, very simple idea, okay? So here we have a physical system. It has many sensors. And let us suppose the true measurements of the sensors are y of t. So y of t is the vector of sensor measurements at time t, the truth. But let us suppose that some nodes have been compromised and what the sensors are reporting is some other vector z, which may or may not be equal to y of t, okay? Now, the actuators will use the information z of t to close the loop because that's what they have been told, right? The sensors are reporting Z of T. Okay, and that, now what we are simply going to do to protect the system is we're going to superimpose a private excitation, E I of T onto the input of the actuator, that's all. And this private excitation is a, it's a random noise, let us say, uh, and I can tell you, I will tell everybody that I am introducing a noise, a random noise. I can even tell them the statistics. I can tell them this is the mean, this is the variance, whatever you like, but I'm not going to tell them the actual waveform. So what I'm going to keep secret is just the waveform of the private noise. And I want you to think of this random privately uh, held noise as a watermark, okay? So the actuator superimposes a watermark on the actuator input that it is supposed to apply. Okay, and the total input ui of t is the superposition of the watermark and the input that it applies based on the false measurements. Okay, now why does this uh, method have any hope? So this random noise is privately added to the actuation input. And just like a watermark, you cannot, uh, like a watermark on a sheet of paper, you cannot get rid of the watermark from the paper, okay? So this watermark is going to percolate all through the system. It's going to show up at all the sensors. And when the sensors report back their measurements to you, this private excitation should, watermark should come back appropriately transformed by the sensors. Now, what you can do is you can compare the watermark that you applied to the excitation signal, to the return sensor measurement and determine whether there is an attack or not. So the controller can check if the reported measurements are appropriately correlated or whatever with the uh, appropriately dependent with the E of T. And I'm going to illustrate this uh, on a very simple uh, first order single input, single output system. So you get the main idea. So let's take a very simple system. There is a single state X, there's a single input U, and it's a linear system. So XT plus one is some coefficient AXT plus BUT plus state noise. And we'll suppose that the state noise is a 
Gaussian, wide Gaussian noise with a mean zero and, and variance sigma squared w. Now what is important is I want you to focus on the variance of this noise. This is sigma squared w, okay? Now the watermarking, dynamic watermarking is I'm, to the feedback input that I'm supposed to apply, I apply a watermark, which is also, let us suppose a wide Gaussian noise with mean zero and variance sigma squared E. And I want you to focus on the sigma squared E here as the variance of the watermark. Now the closed loop system, when you take this input and substitute it into the state equation, you get this. So you get AXT plus B times the nominal input plus B times the watermark plus the state noise. Now I'm going to take this equation and write it in two different ways. I'm going to, in one rewriting, I'm going to preserve WT plus one on the right hand side, everything else on the left. And in the other rewriting, I'm going to preserve BE plus W on the right hand side and everything else on the left. So those are just two rewritings of the same equation. Now this W should have a variance sigma squared W. And therefore the left hand side also should have a variance sigma squared W. Now here BE plus W, because they're independent, should have a variance sigma squared W plus B squared sigma squared E, which means the left-hand side should also have that variance. Now I'm simply going to check for those variances. Of course, I don't have measurement uh, access to the actual state measurements X because I have no sensor. The sensor is Z, it's saying that the output, the state is Z. So I conduct the variance test on Z. So I check that ZT plus one minus AZT minus BUGT minus BE. I'll check whether it's uh, empirical variance is sigma squared W. And I'll also check whether ZT plus one minus AZ minus BUGT. It's empirical variance is B squared sigma squared E plus sigma squared W. Why am I able to do these tests? Because I have access to everything here. Z is what I've been told by the sensor. UG is what I've applied. B is my private watermark. So I can conduct these two tests. Now if clearly, necessary condition, if either test fails, then there is malicious, something strange going on, right? Because they have to be satisfied. Now, supposing the test fails, what should we do? And that depends on the context. I'm not going to address what should be done when the sensor fails. If it is a slow, if, it, if you're driving in a car on a lonely street, then you can just stop your car and that's fine. But if you're driving in a, if it's a unmanned aerial vehicle, you cannot just stop, you may have to land safely. If it is a chemical process control, usually the process control dynamics are slow. So you can go from automatic closed loop to manual operation, etc. So whether you halt the system, reboot it, manually operate it or whatever, that depends on the context and I'm not going to say anything about it. My sole attention is detecting an attack the moment it happens, okay? Now, as I said, this is clearly a necessary condition for, for there to be no attack. Is it sufficient? And here's a fundamental theorem, okay? It's not trivial, okay? So the theorem is this, define the signal V. Okay, I'll explain what V is to you in a minute, but just define a signal V. Uh, and the theorem, the fundamental theorem is simply that the uh, mean square value of V is zero. The empirical variance of V is zero. That's all the theorem is, okay? Now let's interpret it, okay? Now, if I take this definition of V and rewrite it, I can rewrite it in this way. So I can write that ZT plus one minus AZT minus BUGT minus BE is W plus V. In other words, the equation for Z mimics the equation for X with one exception. The exception is there is a zero uh, variance, zero power signal V being added to a positive power noise, okay? So what it says is that the only thing the attacker can do is distort the actual noise, state noise in the system through the addition of a zero power signal V. That is all that the attacker can do, okay? All right, but this proof is non-trivial. I just want to flash these slides to show you that, uh, that it is, there, is, there are so many complications. Okay, what are the consequences? Now, first I want to tell you that the field of security, right, has traditionally evolved in a reactive manner. 
So there will be an operating system. Then somebody finds an attack on this, then they will send you a patch. Microsoft will send you a patch. Then somebody will detect another loophole, then they'll send another patch and so on. And that is the way how networking protocols have evolved. That's how operating systems have evolved. And traditionally, the security is completely reactive. They always protect the, they always shut the barn door after the horse has fled. So all your guarantees are retrospective. I guarantee you that the system is safe to yesterday's attack, okay? But nothing about the future. But what we are saying here is that I don't care what type of attack it is, no matter what the attacker does, by subjecting it to this test, I can guarantee that the only distortion is a zero power signal added to the uh, ambient noise. Now from this, you can derive several consequences, stability consequences and so on. For example, you can make conclusions about stability and mean square optimality, et cetera, et cetera. Now that simple uh, two first order system can be extended to general RMAX processes, which are very, very popular in process control systems or in uh, uh, partially observed multi-input, multi-output systems, which are very popular in uh, electromechanical systems, okay? Let me give you an example, okay? So just to show you, and the attack that I'm going to show you here is much more sophisticated than Stuxnet, okay? Uh, Stuxnet was very simple. Stuxnet, all it did was, it recorded yesterday's measurements and then told the controller that that's today's measurements. So it was operating off of fictitious measurements, okay? Re, it's called a replay attack. This is more sophisticated. So imagine that I have a simple RMAX process uh, and uh, this noise is uh, variance one. And let us suppose that we're doing minimum variance control, which is a very popular strategy in process control. You want to keep the variance of the output as close to uh, zero as possible. So you apply some actuator input and uh, you, now you, I'm going to apply a, a white uh, a watermark and then the closed loop system will be this. And the attacker cannot separate the ambient noise from the watermark. That's what this whole defense is. The attacker sees a total noise. He doesn't know which part of it came from private watermark that was deliberately introduced and what part came from the noise. So he could estimate the noise, okay? And then you can simulate a, a system with a fake noise N by subtracting out this uh, estimated noise. So this is a little bit more sophisticated and report the output of this fake simulated system. Now in the absence of watermark, the actuator would not suspect that there are any malicious measurements, okay? Now let us suppose that the sensor attack begins at a certain time and immediately the one of the tests will jump up and you detect an attack. So this is how uh, this thing works, okay? Now, the first one question that you can ask is, are both tests necessary? They're clearly sufficient, are they necessary? And yes, there are counter examples. This is an attack which passes test one, uh, but fails test two, showing its necessity. And this is another attack which passes test two, but fails test one, okay? And in fact, there have been previous attempts in the literature to do things of this sort but they all use one test and that doesn't work at all. Okay, so it requires two tests. Now there are also uh, 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 challenges to the case of non-Gaussian noise. If it's non-Gaussian noise with some distribution, then uh, uh, the, an easy strategy is to use the same distribution for the watermark, but then you would not be able to make the watermark as small as you like. But here's a characterization of when watermarking guarantee is feasible and uh, there's a certain uh, necessity and sufficient condition. Okay, the core of what I want to tell you is uh, successful implementations. And why are implementations useful, uh, important? The fundamental theory here relies on the inability of the attacker to separate the watermark from noise. Now, if you look at any model of a chemical process control plant or an automobile, all they will describe to you are the deterministic Newtonian di dynamics. So if you look at an automobile, it is simply uh, the, the, the X double dot equals A. That's all it is, okay? So, they, but nobody will describe the noise, road noise, the tire noise, wind noise. Nobody will talk of the amount of uh, noise in uh, in the froth of a chemical process control system or whatever. So we have to do implementation and I don't trust simulations. 
So first we started off by detecting, defending against attacks in our laboratory transportation system. So we have a closed loop uh, uh, system here in our lab. And uh, I'm going to show you a video done by our publicity department. And they did a pretty good job actually, though had, they had one wrong statement somewhere. So this is an intelligent system which has collision avoidance built into it. So if you try, if, you, if a human being tries to cause collision, the system will stop. But even this can be attacked by attacking the sensors. So we're talking of attacking a very smart system. So this is a case where collision happened. There was no watermarking. Now you're going to see the system with the watermarking added. And unfortunately it's not a very exciting video because the vehicles just stop. <laughs> And in fact, that's the whole point of it. When uh, a good uh, cybersecurity defense is working, nothing exciting happens. So after this, we wanted to test whether it actually, uh, oh, but these are the equations. Oh, I want to show you one other thing. Uh, a lot of times people ask, is the watermark itself causing bad performance of the system because you're adding noise to it? And the answer is not really. This is the trajectory of the vehicles with watermarking and with watermark, without watermarking. And basically they're the same. So the watermarking is so small that it doesn't affect the performance of the system, but it is detectable by signal processing. And in this case, the attack fails one test, but passes another test, okay? All right. Now, does it actually work in an actual road vehicle? So we have here a, uh, a Relis campus, which is an ex uh, Second World War airfield, which is available for experimentation. And we wanted to test whether it actually works when the tire meets the road. And I don't mean that metaphorically. The problem issue is that simulation models can only capture deterministic models and not the noise. And uh, our theory depends fundamentally on stochastic considerations. Stochasticity is the most important thing. And uh, so the road noise plays a cr crucial role. So the test to the pudding is only in the tasting. So this is a Lincoln MKZ. This is an actual, this is the closed loop system of the vehicle. And uh, again, you're not going to see much here. This vehicle gets attacked and then it'll stop, okay? Not much to see. But if you're in the vehicle, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, sorry, if the when, the, when the attack is going on, the vehicle is off course, okay? And you can have different types of attack. You can have replay attacks. You can have add random noise. You can do all kinds of, any attack you like. Okay, nothing much to see, it stops, okay? And uh, again, in this case also, it's pretty instantaneous detection and the watermark magnitude can be made pretty small. It doesn't affect the performance, okay? All right, now our goal is to show that this is a general purpose defense to protect uh, cyber physical systems. So we wanted to take completely different classes of systems. For example, process control systems, which are the bedrock of the chemical process industry. So here's an attack on a process control system in the lab. This is a two tank system. Uh, water flows into tank one, and from there it drains into tank two. And the inflow of the water to the top tank is controlled by an electric motor. So the input to the system, the actuator is the voltage of the electric motor. Now, what we are interested in are keeping these two tanks at a certain levels. So let Y1 be the level of tank one, Y2 be the level of tank two. And these levels are measured by pressure sensors at the bottoms of the tank. Thanks, okay. Now let uh, Z1 and Z2 be the reported measurement and they could be hacked. And the question is, we want to protect the system. Now, what may be the purpose of the attacker? For example, the attacker may want to cause overflow of the tank and that can have very damaging consequences. So we will see an attack going on, overflow happening, and then we'll see watermarking take place. So now the system is just uh, transient. We're just starting from zero. 
it's going to come to a steady state in a second where the two levels are being controlled. So the, yeah. So now the system is in steady state. Okay, it's in steady state. And both of them, now we're going to attack the system by hijacking one of the levels. And you'll see that it causes an overflow. Okay, and to defend against this, we add random noise to the voltage on the electric motor. So this is the system uh, starting up, it's just starting up and it's in steady state now. And now an attack will start. Yeah. And immediately watermarking catches it. And in this case, we're going to drain the, uh, drain the tanks, okay? That's the difference, okay? So we see that it works. And now, as I told you, it's very important that this is stochastic defense. So here you see froth. Now the watermarking has to survive this froth, okay? And, uh, there is no model in process control for froth, okay? So, uh, so that's a noise in the system. The watermark has to survive this noise and simulation models will never tell you anything about that, okay? So simulation is not enough. Experimentation is essential. Okay, next I'm going to show you how to attack a power system, okay? So this is an attack on what is called automatic generation control in power systems. And what is automatic generation control? So basically in a power system at all times, you have to keep the generation equal to the uh, consumption demand. Okay, you really cannot store anything it, uh, or else the transmission wires heat up and things like that. So typically what we do is we break up the power system into areas and each area would like to have a balance between supply and uh, uh, demand. But occasionally if it's a hot day in the city, there may be demand in one area, so other areas will help it. So that's what automatic generation control is. You have many areas. So this is area one, which has a bunch of generators, area two generators, area N minus one, there are N areas. And each of these areas, what it puts out are power and frequency. The frequency is very, very important. The way you, the operator tells whether supply equals demand is by looking at the frequency. In Europe, the frequency is 50 Hertz. In the US, it is 60 Hertz. So in uh, Europe, if the frequency went to 49.7, the operator will say, oh my God, uh, consumption is larger than generation. That is my frequency is falling. On the other end, he may do load shedding. On the other end, if the frequency goes to 50.3, then the operator may shut down some generators because there's over generation. So the control loop is to keep the frequency at 50 Hertz. Okay, so that's what is being monitored. And there is a network connecting these areas to share power, okay, through tie lines, okay. And well, those are the sense, all these are sensed variables and there's a multivariable control loop here. For example, if one area is in deficit of power and another area has more power, then you, this control system will adjust the set points of the generators. It will ask one area to produce more or produce less. So that's a control loop. Now, what, uh, so those are the controls. And what is the watermark? We are, so this, anyway, so this is the AGC. It monitors frequency deviations and tie line flows across multiple areas and closes the loop with the generators. And it controls both the frequency deviations and tie line power flows so that each area can respond to its own load. And it operates in the 20, 30 second to 20 minute time scale. Now, how can you attack the system? Very simple. Nowadays, these frequency measurements are made by what are called phaser measurement units which are basically using GPS to timestamp measurements. Nobody cares about position of GPS. GPS gives a good clock. You can timestamp measurements, send them across a network. And by checking the timestamps, I can know what is the frequency, the phase angle difference and things like that, okay? Now, all you simply have to do is hijack that uh, PMU measurement and tell the operator it's not 50 Hertz, it's 49.5 Hertz and bring down the system. So this can be attacked by under-reporting or over-reporting frequency. 
And the way we propose to defend it is by adding a small excitation to the generator set points. Okay, that's the defense. So this is a this is a simulation. So you should not trust anything that I say in this slide or the next because this is a simulation measurement because they will not let us get within a mile of these generators yet, okay? So this is a synthetic power system, four area synthetic power system with 10 generators. Now, first thing is uh, to show the convince uh, people that watermarking doesn't add any penalty to the operation. So this is the control command with and without watermarking. And you see that they're pretty much the same. So watermarking doesn't have any perceptible effect. And here we have a destabilization attack on automatic gain control. So there's an attack that starts at 10 minutes, but the operator only realizes it at uh, time 18 minutes, okay, when it goes very high, okay? So this is an amplified view. The attack starts at time 10, until then it's going this way. At 18, it crosses some red line, uh, three sigma, two sigma, whatever limit of the operator, and then the operator raises an alarm. So, but that's very dangerous because eight minutes of attack is going on and that's terrible but watermarking will catch it instantly, okay? As soon as attack happens, you catch it. Now, okay, the uh, now this is an actual system that we are now working on. We received a huge, uh, uh, we're working on a huge project uh, by the US Department of Energy in conjunction with Argonne National Lab and with a bunch of industries. And we have some other universities also working with us, uh, MIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, some companies and Argonne National Lab. And uh, what it is, is this. We're looking at a future energy system where we use solar power, okay? In the, uh, so we're talking of a solar power dominated distribution system. So as we increase the use of solar power, many homes in the future will have rooftop solar panels, okay? And these are what are called, uh, these are examples of what are called distributed energy resources as opposed to centralized energy resources. And we may eventually come to a photovoltaic dominated distribution grid. Now, so imagine lots and lots of homes with the solar panels and the solar panels are grid connected. So they can take power from the grid when the sun is not shining, but they can give power to the grid when there is a lot of sunshine, right? Now this interface is a power electronics interface, okay? And that could be electronically hacked so now you have a whole bunch of homes being electronic hacked with some virus or something like that. And then you can bring down the solar powered uh, distributed system, okay? So attack on large number of edge devices. And what we have done is a prelim I'm going to report to you an actual preliminary implementation on a laboratory scale grid tied inverter. We just in our first year, we actually aimed for a full implementation. I think I should say that somewhere, okay. So, so this is the system. This, uh, this is your uh, solar panel. It's a DC generator. And this is an inverter to convert DC to AC so you can interface with the grid. So now here on this side is the grid and there is all this inverter control and so on. And uh, what the sense measurements here are the grid current and the grid voltage. And you can attack those. And so here we add an excitation to the power electronics a little bit and uh, attack detect algorithm. So this is the dynamic watermarking scheme. And uh, here is uh, implementation. So before attack, it's like this. After the attack, it's a very small attack, okay? We can catch it. And this is a large DOE project, as I said, uh, aiming at implementation. Okay, the last one implementation I want to show you is an attack on a helicopter basically, or an unmanned aerial vehicle flight control system. So this is a laboratory uh, setup for a helicopter. It's a two rotor aerial vehicle flight control system. And here we attack the elevation measurements and the watermark uh, catches, the, catches the attack uh, pretty fast. Okay, so let me make some concluding remarks. So is the, I'm proposing a possible general purpose defense of cyber physical systems. And the point I want to make is uh, people, uh, I mean, we have not so far been able to secure operating systems. Every day I get a different patch from Microsoft. We're not able to separate uh, networking stuff. Every day there is some patch. So people can ask, hey, listen, when you throw the physical system into it, 
it becomes even much more complicated because the variety of physical systems and the variety of ways they can be attacked and so on, isn't this problem much more complicated? And what I'm trying to tell you is that if you use their information abstraction, then you can protect it. And in fact, I can even protect it against networking attacks. So through this information defense, if you introduce spurious packets, et cetera, I can even catch those. If you upset the timing of packets, you do all those things. So we can even detect attacks on the networking layer, information processing layer, let alone the sensor physical layer. Okay, so that's, so the possible general purpose def, uh, defense and a lot of societally and economically important future infrastructure will be vulnerable. And these new uh, very uh, efficiency uh, inducing uh, technologies will not be accepted by the public unless you can give safety guarantees. Nobody's going to open themselves up with their car if the car can be attacked or to a power grid or whatever, right? And uh, there are many interesting problems and there's a whole bunch of uh, references and I will stop there. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for a beautiful lecture. Uh, questions? Uh, perhaps I have one then uh, uh, waiting for others. Uh, I mean, your model was uh, a linear system in the control theoretic mm -hmm. sense. I mean, can you can you expect to to introduce such uh, uh, mechanisms in the non in, in certain classes of nonlinear system and get similar yeah. results? No, very good um, question. Yeah. So the first thing is, so all systems are nonlinear, right? And typically, what we the way we do control is we do uh, we linearize it around a set point, right? Mm -hmm. And from a control systems viewpoint, the the system is typically linear because you are at a certain set point and you're doing very small perturbations around the set point. And in fact, you want only small perturbations because the control system is supposed to take care of it, right? So mm -hmm. in the in that uh, regime of small uh, deviations on the set point, it is typically linear. So that's what people typically used for control system design and process control or a power system or whatever, and that's what they're using. However, you can also uh, do, uh, even for nonlinear system, this is a necessary condition. And if you want to get a little bit more advanced, you can use strategies like uh, feedback linearization and so on, which are you know, used in uh, uh, robotics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. so those are some of the possibilities. Yes, um, and uh, I mean, a related question about the, the dimension of the system. So, I mean, your, your noise was uh, was um, additive, right, on this, uh, on, the, on mm -hmm. the input. Assume you have a, a, a the, 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 how does it work for, it's a very naive question, but does the same thing uh, 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 work when you would have a, a high dimensional system? I mean, how should your noise Evolve with the dimensionality of the system. Should do that for every input dimension, or um... okay. Uh, let me answer the question that I think you're asking. Okay, mm -hmm. so one question is: supposing you have a high-dimensional system uh, with uh, lots of sensors and so on, yeah. uh, will the complexity of the defense uh, be growing with the number of sensors? And the answer is no. One actuator, as long as it can control several, uh, as long as its reachability tree includes a bunch of sensors, it will cover all of them. You know what I mean? Oh, I see. So in okay. other words, okay. if it's a fully connected system, then just yeah. one actuator can propagate. protect the entire, protect the entire system. Okay, so yeah. it, will, it doesn't yeah. grow okay. at all. Yeah. 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 I see, I see, that's beautiful. Okay, yeah. So the complexity, uh, that doesn't yeah. go with the dimension of the system. So, okay, no, I see. No. So in fact, I need only one honest actuator. Oh, I, I see. Uh, yeah, is it linked? Oh, okay. okay, so it's very different from this Byzantine thing where there is a sort yeah. of trade. So the, 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 this yeah. question was triggered by that, right? Where right. you need a, right. a proportion of uh, right. of uh, honest guys. So you, 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 right. it's, it's enough to have one, that's what you say, right? Exactly, yeah. So this, So this protects against Byzantine attacks, by the way on the networking protocols, because it's yeah. a purely information layer defense. 
Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. So we are. So it's all. It all lies in the abstraction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of course, it's model based though. But but typically, when I'm doing a control system, I do know the model. Now, if you don't yeah. know the model, then you can do system identification in real time, and we are actually doing that also. So you can kind of mm-hmm. elevate this game as high as you please. Mm. No, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, very interesting. So, as uh, any uh, so other questions, please. I think Patrick has one, and Jim as well. Okay, Patrick. Yes. So, uh, thank you, Kumar. A very interesting talk. In a way, I, I was trying to connect what you propose with uh, uh, differential privacy, where where noise is also added, but there it's to protect privacy so that the query cannot get you and information about an individual from an aggregate database. Mm-hmm. Somehow you, you, you do the dual, you inject noise so that uh, you can identify which one of the node is corrupted. Is, mm-hmm. is there any such link between, between differential privacy and your scheme? Yeah, so, so there are, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, stochastic considerations, you know, uh, they come into these information systems in kind of three ways, okay? Uh, one, uh, one very traditional one is what is called uh, uh, excitation signals. Supposing you have a control system and you want to understand its dynamics, then you introduce some perturbations just to determine its dynamics. So this is called, so you have, otherwise you cannot identify certain modes of the system unless you excite them. So adding excitation has been uh, traditional uh, for system identification. And in fact, there's a very interesting experiment. It turned out that in Sweden many years ago, they took the entire output of one plant and excited the Swedish power grid to understand its dynamics. I don't think they would ever be brave enough to do that in the US, but Sweden is a more dynamic country. They did it. Uh, another way is uh, differential privacy, where, as you said, the goal is to uh, uh, pr- protect uh, the information and so on. So here is a third way. This is uh, not to identify, not to protect information, not to uh, keep information private, but to protect the system against all kinds of Byzantine attacks, yes. Okay, thank mm-hmm. you. Tim, you had a question. Uh, so, uh, so this is Jim, hi, hi Kumar. Uh, hi, I Jim. Love- yeah. mm-hmm. As usual, a beautiful mix of theory, and then you implemented it well. So that's always wonderful. Uh, maybe I misunderstood something. I thought the the, the proofs that you have are hold in the limiting cases as t goes to infinity, and, and and so I was wondering about detection times and how many. You know, is there a limit? It, what what do you know about the numbers of values before you can actually do the detection? At one point, you said, "Oh, the yeah. attack starts, and I see it immediately." Right. And, and so I wondered, is it, was that really immediately yeah. or, or? No, no, you're asking a perfect question, actually. So, so what I've done is uh, what a theoretician would do. What I, what I said was, hey, listen, I'm going to write the system as asymptotic singularity of measures, right? That's what this asymptotic thing is. So I said, I'm just going to state this result asymptotically, okay? So let's go back over here. Okay, there is something, uh, well, let's see, where is this? I just said, you conduct these tests for check, checking the asymptotic variance. Now to convert, to go from this to a statistical test is completely straightforward. You just, uh, it's just Neiman Pearson, okay? So uh, I didn't go into the details of uh, how many samples you would take and what you would set as your two sigma or three sigma limits and so on. And that is all the standard trade off between miss and false alarm, all that stuff, all the traditional theory comes into being here. I just skipped over that. In practice though, I would use that. I would, and in fact, we have done that. We set certain limits. And then when the limits are crossed, then you detect an attack. And of course that raises a very important question. What is the time elapsed between the initiation of an attack and the time to detect it, right? And in practice here, so there are two answers I want to give you. Uh, The theoretical answer is, yes, there is always a trade-off between three things, actually. 
if I introduce a higher watermark, higher level watermark, I, I cause more perturbation to the system, then I can detect things faster. So higher, higher perturbation of the nominal trajectory will allow me faster detection, but that may not be acceptable to practitioners. There's a second trade-off and the second trade-off is uh, between the level of the watermark and the time to detection. So right. if I choose a very small time to detection, uh, then I should uh, choose a high level of watermark, right? So there's a, uh, there's a de delay, uh, detection delay versus watermark. A third trade-off is between miss and false alarm. To, if I absolutely don't want false alarm, then I should keep a six sigma window. I'll never get a false alarm. But on the other hand, the miss probability is higher. So that's again a trade-off. And these are standard practical trade-offs like is done in a radar. When you get a deflected signature in radar, is it a plane, is it not a plane? So standard stuff. I have nothing to say about those things, but you're absolutely right. But in our examples, practically, we are seeing that it's pretty, pretty darn good. So for example, in, protect, in protecting that water tank or in catching the automobile attack or uh, in the solar power inverter attack, et cetera, it functions practically well, which you have to take with a grain of salt, what that statement is. Okay, right. So I, actually I was particularly impressed by the car driving example, right? Where, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't have, all, you can't have, uh, you can't have false negatives, right? And so, uh, but yet in that example, yes. our stop pretty soon after you said the attack started. So right. in practice, you can tune that enough or you're getting enough sample per second so that from a practical standpoint for driving yeah. that. So what we did was we basically, you know, we're dealing with a complicated system because you're dealing with the canvas of the, <laughs> the car also, <laughs> which is in between, right? Uh, so, so we are dealing with uh, the drive-by-wire system uh, and uh, CAN or Ethernet uh, interface and so on. So we this uh, and that has its own uh, packet delays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we were very, very uh, Edison-like in our testing. We just said, hey, "Listen, let's try different uh, watermark levels and see if we can catch it pretty instantaneously." And the answer is uh, instantaneously enough. We could do it. Yeah. Yeah, I can only give you a uh, pragmatic uh, on the ground test that we did. But if you want to go even further, then there's a whole uh, set of trade-offs that you'll have to look at. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Uh...